Good to see this number out this morning. Delighted that we have this opportunity to worship the God of heaven. Good to have some visiting with us. Good to have Chad Lynn visiting with us. Brother Chad preaches in West Virginia. We're delighted to have him here. Good to have the Owens family with us. They come down from Charlotte where the skies are a little bluer and the grass is a little greener. And love them, appreciate their family so much. And good to have some others visiting. Good to have Ricky with us. Ricky Watts. Ricky's son is the one who passed away, so we ask that you remember him in your prayers and his family and Mary and all, and uh, want them to know how much we love and appreciate them. If you have your Bible this morning, if you'll turn with me to the Gospel of John and the second chapter, I want to read with you beginning at verse 1. John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. On the third day there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there was set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And then he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and did not stay there many days. There are many interesting studies one can make when they look at the miracles of Jesus Christ. In the book of Mark in the third chapter, you remember that some had tried to deny that the miracles were done by the power of God and insisted that Jesus performed them by the power of the devil. And you know that was what Jesus warned was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I do not think we can commit that sin today as we did not see the miracles, but I do believe that we need to affirm that the Bible is correct when it describes every miracle. I am certain that every miracle recorded in the Word of God happened just as the writer said. So when the writer talks about the feeding of the 5,000, or it talks about Jesus walking on the water, I believe that with all my heart. And the miracles are an important part of the life of Christ. And what I'd like to do for just a few moments of our time is notice some things from John 2 and then observe some other passages and then make application. The first thing I want us to observe is the miracle Jesus performed in John 2. When Jesus came to the wedding, notice several things. There are some things we do know and a lot we do not know. First, we observe in John 2, there's going to be a wedding. And you think about that being a joyous occasion. That here is a man and woman who are going to be wed. They're going to be joined together as is the law of God. They're going to be glued together and united in that marriage and that marriage relationship. Secondly, we know that Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. You know, I think that that is an interesting thought. You know, there are a lot of people that kind of tend to have the view, Jesus never enjoyed life. But you know that here was a wedding feast and Jesus attended. Now, there's been some weddings I went to that I did not enjoy as much but was drugged there. But you know, for the most part, weddings are a joyous occasion. And so you think about Jesus going to the wedding and he accepted the invitation and attended that occasion. But there are some things we do not know. First, when I studied the book of John and the second chapter, I do not know the name of the couple. I do not know the name of the parents or of the bride or the groom. 
And I thought about this bride and groom that we know little about, and yet Jesus was at their wedding. I thought about a beautiful picture that the Son of God attended the wedding of this unknown couple. But you know Jesus attends every wedding when man and woman are brought together because he is there to sanctify and to make sanction that relationship. But then I thought about something else. There's something that we do not understand. We do not understand why the family ran out of wine. All it says is that the wine ran out. But that's no small detail. In that day and time, people had to take off work, and a wedding feast just wasn't one day. Sometimes it would last several days or weeks. And if the wedding feast was not up to par, people could sue you in that day and time. And so here you find Jesus is there when the wine ran out. Notice then that Mary comes to Jesus and says, We have no wine. And observe what Jesus is willing to do. He turned the water to wine. Now, I'm willing to leave it just like John wrote it because I think sometimes we miss the main point when we get tied up looking at other things. Notice that the Bible just said Jesus turned water to wine. And you know what is important about that? I see Jesus as the great transformer, that Jesus is the one who can change things. In Bible class, we look through several lives in the Gospel of John that the lives Jesus changed. And I want to talk about that a little bit more in our lesson today, that Jesus changed a lot of things while he lived on earth, and Jesus is still in the business of changing, transforming lives. If you take your Bible, notice that Jesus not only turned water to wine and changed the component of water into something else, he does that in the lives of people. Take your Bible and look in the book of John and the first chapter. And when you come to the book of John and the first chapter, notice if you will in verse 42 that there is a man identified as Simon. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus looked at this man named Simon, and he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. That is what he had been given. That was his name. But notice Jesus said, you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. That's Peter. Have you ever thought that in the life of Peter that this man translated his aim and became a follower of Jesus? We find him in Luke 5 fishing for fish. And then we find that Jesus performed a miracle. And that man saw the power of Jesus, saw that he was the Christ, fell at his knees. And you remember that he said that, depart from me for I am a sinful man. And then Peter changed his aim. He put up the fishing nets and became a fisher of men, a follower of Christ. Now you know one thing. Peter had to continue to make sure that his life conformed to the image of Christ. You remember in Luke 23, he denied him. And how many times have we looked at the denial of Peter and we thought, well, Peter, how could you have done that? But even in his weakness, what does Peter do? Peter repents. And in Acts 2, we see the solid rock standing up for Jesus. Then in Galatians 2, we see Peter fall again. But you know, Peter takes that rebuke, and later we read his epistles. We see that this man was one that was continuously transforming his life to fit into the image of Jesus. You know, sometimes when we talk about baptism, we understand that there's a transformation that the old man is put to death, we're buried, we're raised to walk in newness of life, we have new aim, new purpose, new life. But you know, I don't know about you, but my life at that point, though I'm a new individual and now I'm a Christian, I still need to be transformed. Daily, I'm being transformed and renewed and working on who I need to be because sometimes that old man doesn't want to stay dead. Sometimes the old temptations and the old problems and all the things that I've had to deal with in life, they come back. Do you think Satan just said, you know, he's now a Christian, I'll just leave him alone? I'll tell you, that's who he's after. You and I, 
And I'll tell you, if we don't feel the temptation of life, and if we don't see the need daily to be renewed into the image of God, what we'll do is we'll become stagnant, and we won't be what we need to be. Peter, what did you do? Daily, I saw the need to be transformed and changed into what Christ wants me to be. But then if you take your Bible, look, if you will, in the book of Mark and the third chapter. And when you come to the book of Mark and the third chapter, notice, if you will, a statement that Jesus made when he's talking about James and John. In Mark chapter 3, in verse 17, notice that he talks about James the son of Zebedee and John the brother of James. He gave them the names sons of thunder. Why was that? He wanted to call, call fire down upon a village that would not receive Jesus. And so here you see, they wanted to call down fire when this village rejected Christ. And Jesus said, you don't know who you're of. So I understand this much. At one time, they seemed to have a problem with their temper. But what did they do? When you read John's epistles, what is he identified as? The apostle of love. Have you ever thought about how Jesus can transform and change our lives? That when we take the word of God and we submit and yield to the teaching of the Spirit, that we can be transformed and changed. Look in your Bible in the book of Matthew and the ninth chapter. And when you look at Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9, you'll find there was a man identified as Matthew, and it says he was a tax collector. To the Jews, he was a betrayer, a traitor to the cause. He was collecting money for the Roman power. And most Jews said that the tax collectors uh, would charge more exorbitant price and pocket some. They were known to be thieves. But notice that this man heard two words from Jesus, follow me. And that tax collector was transformed and changed into a devoted disciple. He became devout in his faith. But then look again in the book of Luke in the 8th chapter. In the Gospel of Luke in the 8th chapter, notice there is a woman identified as Mary Magdalene. And notice what it says about this woman in verse 2. She had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Here was a woman who was demon-possessed. But what do we know about this woman? We know that she was transformed and changed. And in the book of Matthew and the 28th chapter, in beginning at verse 1, she comes to the tomb of Jesus. She sees that he's been raised from the dead. And she goes back with the resurrection message. Do you see how lives can be changed and transformed? Do we see that by the power of God's word and by the grace of God that we can become people in the image of Christ? I think one of the shining examples is in Acts 2. When you had the very ones who'd put Jesus on the cross, the very ones who said crucify him, when they heard that they had crucified the Lord in Christ, they were pricked in their heart and they said, well, what do we do? There's nothing we can do. We've killed the Messiah. And what does Peter say? Oh, don't underestimate the power of God. He said, what you need to do is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The very one you killed, it's his name, his power that can take away your sin. You ever thought about in Corinth and 1 Corinthians 6 and verses 9 through 11 when Paul gives that list of all the ungodly deeds? And he says that if you live that kind of life, you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he comes down and he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed. You were justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. You were sanctified and changed. I'll tell you, my friend, if Jesus can turn water to wine, he can change the lives of men and women. But that brings up a third thought in our study. Wherever Jesus transformed a life, it brought joy. You know, we live in a world where people are looking for joy and happiness and they're looking in all the wrong places. We talked about the man in John 9 who Jesus healed this morning, who was blind. But you ever thought about the joy that was brought when Jesus gave him his sight? 
And then he told him that you're talking to the Son of God. And you remember that man said, Lord, I believe the joy in his heart. In John 11, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, you get the picture in John 12 where Lazarus and Jesus are eating together. I think of the joy from sadness to joy when we're transformed in the image of Christ. I want to take that. I want to make application in the lesson years. The first thing I want us to recognize is that I care not how low we may be or how far we may have strayed. Jesus can transform our life. Jesus has that power. Now, I must come to him, and I must come to him on his terms, but I want to tell you something, my friend. Jesus can take a life that's miserable and bring joy to it. When I put myself under his teaching, and he gives me a new beginning and a purpose, I have something to look forward to. You know, I wasn't always a child of God. There was a time in my life that I'm ashamed of. There's a time in my life that I did a lot of things that I look back and when I think about it, I just cringe. And I thought all these things were going to bring happiness and joy. And you know what, my friend? They did not. You know what I've come to learn? The devil sells a lie and we believe it. And you know something? One thing I've come to learn is that the devil keeps lying to us and we keep believing it when God has given us the truth. The problem is the truth sometimes hurts. But once you get past the hurt and you see the change that needs to be made, you become joyful that you're now in the image of Christ. There is pain in change. There's pain in seeing yourself for who you are. You know, there's a lot of things even today when I look at myself, I say, oh, I am such a wretched man. But I'm thankful I can still continue to transform. It's a process, people. It's not one and done. I don't know about you, but day in and day out, I get up and I have to pray that this day I'll be better than I was the other day and that I work to be more like Christ and that I can have the kind of life that brings glory to Jesus. Secondly, don't get burned out on that. There have been many times in my life I've got burned out saying, why do I keep doing this and why do I keep falling short and why am I doing this and I shouldn't even be preaching and I should just give up. But I want to tell you one thing. I'm thankful that when I make my blunders and mistakes and I realize where I am, I get back up and my God will help me change my life. It's a process. But I want to tell you something else. I think if we would bring Jesus back into the home, we could transform the home life and marriages. We need him back just like at that wedding he was at. We need him in the marriage. You know what I think one of the greatest problems today is in our country is I see people when I do weddings, they'll plan a wedding. They have everything down to a T. They want this done, they want that done. I go to rehearsals and I get so bored. I stand there, and I'm thinking, they're never going to get this done. <laughs> I'll never forget one old fella. Some of the groomsmen were cutting up, and I was in the back, and this old fella come up and said, oh, boy, we're in trouble. He said, what do you mean? He said, I just saw your bride-to-be, and she was giving the look like my old bull, just turning her head like she's mad. And he said, we're all in trouble. And I thought, well, here I go. I didn't even do nothing. <laughs> well, plan a wedding. We don't plan the marriage. Don't plan the day. Plan for after the day. That's the most important part. That day with all of its sweet memories is going to one day just be in a collection book that you somewhere stick under the coffee table that gets dust. What's really important is what's right here and if you're following Christ. That's where the marriage is made. But I want to tell you something else. We can start trying to bring this nation back. I don't think that I have the power to do that, but I want to tell you, I see the country going down morally, but I know the only cure for society is by trying to transform people one by one. Don't think the political system is going to do it. Do it by trying to tell people about Jesus. He's the one that brings about change. I remember one time, this old fella was walking up and down the beach and he was throwing little old 
things back in that had washed up and they said, you're not going to be able to save all these lives that have washed up on the beach of these little uh, uh, creatures. And he looked at him and said, no, but I saved the life of that one. I can't change all society, but I know one thing. I can't change anything, but I can take him to the one who can. I can take you to the one who can transform you. And the churches, we need to see what we need to be. That we are to be the people of God. The church is essential and yet so many times divided. Why? We need to get back to the Bible and put Jesus back in charge. Don't put any man in charge. I care not how talented he is. I care not how wise he is. We don't put him in charge. And in my preaching, I need to be preaching Christ. Young men and young ladies, in the days of your youth, you need let Jesus transform you into His image. What was it Paul said in Romans 12? Oh, the powerful passage Paul said. When he was writing to the church at Rome, he tells them what they needed to do. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Transformed. Jesus is the transformer. He can change us into what we need to be. Question. Have you been baptized? Are you walking with him? Or have you strayed? I want to tell you something. As I've looked out over this past week at all that has gone on in the lives of other people, one thing I know, as for me, Whatever days I have left, I pray that I change to the image of God. And when I fall short, I see my need. And I live to His glory. Because if I want to live with Him, I need to live for Him. If you need to obey the gospel, we pray you come as together.